Britain's finest unit for forensic investigation, has a groundbreaking new mission. A mission that will put the full arsenal of modern forensics to the ultimate test. For the first time, the cold case team will strive to put a face to some extraordinary human remains from the long distant past. It's not the kind of face that children would happily look at. It's the kind of face that children would cry at. And that's quite sad for someone who's so very young. Forensic anthropology, facial reconstruction, and painstaking research will open new windows on history. As they reconstruct the lives of people not seen for centuries. This historical research is allowing me to investigate people's experiences at different times throughout history. He certainly had a nasty crack to the top of his head. That must have been so painful. So we've got the face, the facial reconstruction, and we've added some textures. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That, that, that is just superb. The team's latest case surrounds a puzzling skeleton discovered in a medieval Christian burial ground in Ipswich. The archaeologists who found the body believe the man is from Africa. This is really important. What was he doing there? What event could have brought an African to medieval Ipswich? And what led to his demise? I think I may just have found a cause of death. The investigation unearths evidence from the 13th century that will challenge the view of Britain's ethnic past. It's amazing. It's just, you know, it's what gets scientists excited. Is this skeleton irrefutable proof of an African presence in medieval England? And if so, who is he? The Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification at the University of Dundee. The forensics team is about to start work on a curious skeleton presumed to be male and African. It was excavated from a medieval burial ground in Ipswich in the 1990s. But his identity and his story are a mystery. The first stage of the investigation is for head of unit Professor Sue Black to examine the skeleton, along with her colleague Dr. Xanthi Mallet. Um, excavation medieval burial, burial site in Ipswich. Ipswich. Also, to report on the site suggests the skull showed sub Saharan African characteristics. Okay. They record every detail. The size of that. And Sue is immediately struck by what could be a clue to confirming the skeleton's ethnic origin. Very wide. So look at the width. Huge, that. huge palate. You know that that that's that's a jaw flaring that Tom Cruise would be very proud of. Yep. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It was it Ipswich? Mm -hmm. But before tackling the complex issue of his possible ancestry, they begin by putting an age to the man at time of death. Well, we're definitely in the adult yeah. category. If you look at the sutures. Yep. They're in the process of closing. When you're very young, they're quite far apart, and you can see them really clearly. And as you get older, they, they ossify, and they sort of merge and fuse together. And they've started to disappear round at the back here. And that's an indication of age. So we've definitely got a mature adult here. We've not necessarily got an elderly adult, but we're at the older yeah. end of mature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not 40s, probably getting a bit older. The archaeologists who discovered the skeleton classified it as sub-Saharan African, and the shape of its jaw would seem to fit with that. Not an overly prognathic jaw, but it is, it yeah. is a little bit prognathic, and I think we'd be very happy to, to agree with our classification of sub-Saharan African. The whole investigation will hinge on being able to ascertain beyond any reasonable doubt where this man came from. Skull shape is commonly relied upon to indicate ethnic origin. Although every skull is unique, a prognathic or relatively prominent jaw is linked to skulls of sub-Saharan African ancestry. Over 3,000 miles from Ipswich. Bottom line is, his skin was a different colour to yours and mine. 
And that's fundamentally what we mean. And when we look at him in terms of his position um, in Ipswich <laughs> at that time, he'd have been really different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And he'd have been really different because of the colour of his skin. The initial observation has confirmed that he was male, between 40 and 60 years old, and around 5 feet 6 inches tall. But the cause of his death is still a mystery. And there's much more they'll need to substantiate about his ancestral origins. He's a very well-developed, mature man. So a lot of muscle development in there. I think, height-wise, he's not overly tall. He's sort of of middling height, even by you know UK standards at that time. He's about five foot six, maybe five foot seven. But he is, I would say, a 40 to 60 year old male who may well be African in terms of his origin. Okay, what we have today. Before further analysis takes place, Sue and Xanthi need to discuss the case with Dr. Caroline Wilkinson. She will oversee the facial reconstruction and is the team's ancestry expert. Okay, ancestry is interesting because that's not something I know a lot about. I know you're much more comfortable with that than I am. The only thing that, that I picked up, apart from the really heavy, dense uh, nature of the skull, was the palate. The palate was very wide yep. and very big teeth, which was, to me, was a clear indication. We're not talking, you know, Anglo-Saxon, Celt mm. kind of dentition at all. I think he's going to have an interesting face. I'll be quite yeah. pleased to do a reconstruction on him. And if we're going to do... Uh facial reconstruction, we can do it from a laser scan, so. Okay, so you want him laser scanned? Yeah. And they will need to gather a lot more information. You really need to go back and speak to the archaeologists. I think we need to have some idea about where they were found, what type of a site it was, were there any other individuals around them, are we looking at high status, low status, is there anything known about that archaeological site, um, were there any artefacts, I think that's a really important way to go. Yep. Excellent. I think that's all we can do. Yep. I think what, what makes him interesting is the potential ancestry. So the fact that we might be looking from somebody who's sub-Saharan African. And in Ipswich, I think, in medieval times, that for me is, is very interesting. It might not be something that in a modern scenario, if I was doing a forensic case, would be in the least little bit unusual. But I can't help feeling that if we go back to medieval times, this is somebody who would stand out. Xanthi leaves Dundee to start her historical road trip. Her task is to hunt down any information she can that will help the team build up a profile of who the man was. I'm very lucky in that I have been given an opportunity by the University of Dundee to construct a team and everybody who is in this department is hand-picked for a variety of reasons. Dr. Wolfram Meyer-Augenstein is the team's stable isotope expert. He will analyze trace minerals found deep inside the Ipswich man's skeleton, which could tell us where he lived. There is nobody else that I would trust for a forensic investigation. He is the best that there is. And he has not only a national reputation, he has a huge international reputation. In order to carry out his isotopic analysis, Wolfram needs samples of teeth and bone. The information it could reveal is vital. A single molar tooth could reveal where in the world the Ipswich man spent his early years. While a small section of his thigh bone could tell us where he was living in the last years of his life. What we see here might overlap with the information we get from the tooth or it might actually be completely different should the person have moved. And since I understand the person was found in a grave in Ipswich, and you have information that he might be of sub-Saharan descent. Uh, clearly he must have moved during his lifetime at some stage. Xanthi has come to Ipswich where the skeleton was discovered. In medieval times, Ipswich was a thriving port situated on the River Orwell. 
The town had connections across Europe and the route is still used for trading to this day. Medieval England is often thought of as an insular society, but in reality it was at the center of a network of globalized trading. It's not hard to imagine a means by which an African man could have got here. In medieval times, Ipswich would have been a, a huge port that would have been really very busy with trade and lots of international crews would have travelled up here from all over the world. The burial site where the man was found is located near the river. Xanthi's hoping she can dig up some clues about his identity. Xanthi's enthusiasm and her, her personality and her character makes her ideal for going out and asking people questions. And she does that particularly well. She's meeting Keith Wade from Suffolk Archaeology. They excavated the bodies back in the 1990s before the site was built on as part of a new housing development. Before the flats were built, we excavated the whole site. And the last phase of activity was a cemetery. And it lies within the precinct of a friary, the Franciscan oh, really? friary, the Grey Friars. And the friary was built in about 1290 and then was suppressed in 1538. This shows all the features excavated on this site. These burials are fairly, they're all in single graves. He was where, did you say, approximately? He's up Roughly right there. in the corner? Yeah. OK. I can show you a photograph. Oh, is this um, his actual burial? Yeah, that's the actual burial. Okay. And as you can see, it looks like a fairly standard yeah. medieval burial. And why has he been dated uh, medieval? We have very little evidence, other than the fact that's the type of burials you normally see in the medieval period. And one of them has a belt buckle, which is late 13th or 14th century. So... Our Ipswich man was discovered in a burial ground next to a Christian friary. Two pieces of evidence suggest he is medieval. A belt buckle found among the 150 skeletons. And also the friary itself was only in operation between the mid-13th and the mid-16th centuries. Before the investigation can proceed, there is an important question to answer. Just how unusual is it for an African skeleton to be found in a burial site from this time period? To find out, Xanthi has come to the University of London to meet medieval historian and migration expert, Professor Jim Bolton. We found uh, a medieval individual who's of African origin. Is that as unusual as my kind of gut instinct is telling me it is? Yes, undoubtedly, okay. undoubtedly. It's very unusual indeed. There is some written evidence, I think, of, medi uh, of Africans in medieval England, uh, but to find skeletons, I've not come across it before at all. So what do we know about the history of migration to this country? If you go back to the Roman occupation of Britain, then you would expect to find Africans and people from the Middle East here as soldiers, as merchants in particular, and you would expect that because Rome is a, is a multinational empire. Then you get a huge gap, and that's between the end of the Roman Empire, as it were, and almost the 16th and 17th centuries, when Africans begin to come into England because of the slave trade and as personal servants in great households. And, but between the fall of the Roman Empire, which is 5th century AD, and about 15, 1600, then it is rare to find Africans. It's very rare indeed. And very rare that they should be in a friary as well, because yeah. that assumes they've been given a Christian yeah. burial. And most of the people I know uh, who come from uh, Africa or North Africa or Spain would be, would be Muslim. Uh, so I, why would they end up in a Christian burial ground? What Professor Bolton has told Xanthi has raised the stakes in the investigation. Between the fall of the Roman Empire and the 16th century, there are virtually no records of Africans in England. This makes the Ipswich man so improbable that the team must be sure of their findings. And the first thing they must prove scientifically is the age of the skeleton. Is he really medieval? To find out, a sample of the Ipswich man's bone has been sent for carbon dating. Mm. 
The bone sample is crystallized into a powder which is then combusted in a sealed glass tube and converted into a gas. The gas is then converted back to solid carbon which can be analyzed and dated. An accelerator mass spectrometer analyzes the ratio of radiocarbon content, which will ascertain the age of the bones themselves. It's a vital part of the investigation, but it will be two weeks before the team get the results. Caroline Wilkinson is responsible for giving the Ipswich man a face. She is one of the world's leading facial reconstruction experts, working on historical faces as well as contemporary criminal investigations. Her scientific background, her artistic background, and her intuitive nature when it comes to faces in particular is absolutely second to none. So I'm very fortunate. I have a world-class leader in her field in this department. She will perform a detailed examination of the skull with her colleague, Caroline Needham. Okay. Do you want them separate for now? Wow. If we've got some guttering and we've got quite rectangular orbits, that would suggest more sub-Saharan African. So you can see the mouth's a bit further forward than you know, the rest of the face. Yeah. Which, again, would suggest African. Mm-hmm. And really wide palate, which again is another sub-Saharan African trait. Hmm, interesting. interesting face, huh? So, I mean, I'd say that it looks like it could be sub-Saharan African. I would say the nose is not typical. Okay. But not impossible. And the shape of the cranium is not typical. Mm hmm But there's quite a lot of other indicators. Although Caroline agrees that he is of African origin, she thinks he's likely to be North African, from a country like Morocco or Tunisia. And she's hoping that some of the team's tests will help pinpoint his origins. Whatever the results, she's in no doubt that he will be a striking individual. We might get an indication of ancestry from DNA analysis. And also, we might be able to tell where the person has lived by looking at stable isotope analysis, and that might in itself indicate ancestry. It's quite a big, robust, and um, very muscly face. So it's going to be quite an interesting skull to reconstruct. I think he's going to have a very uh, individual face. The first stage of the process is to create a laser-scanned 3D model. This will be used as a base for the layers of facial tissue. But Caroline will need further historical and scientific evidence in order to recreate his face accurately. For Xanthi, the lack of knowledge of Africans in medieval England makes researching this case a unique challenge. What was the African doing here? And what would people have made of him? Xanthi has come to the National Archives in Kew to meet a man who has single-handedly been trying to build an evidence-based picture of early African history in England. Onyeka has been researching thousands of medieval documents. And what he's found is fascinating. He has come to the conclusion that the African found in Ipswich would have been treated with more tolerance than we've seen during later periods of history. The Africans who were here would have been here doing a specific skill or trade. Their position would have been determined by personal relationships that they developed, right. rather than based upon skin colour. There was not a scientific understanding of race that comes about in the 19th century, yeah. the idea that human groups fall into different specific racial categories. That was not present in medieval England. 
How many individuals of African origin would you have found in the UK that's, back in the medieval period? That's difficult for us to know. Yeah. Because during the medieval period, there are not consistent um, and substantial records. There are few records of the population as a whole, let alone of an African presence. However, having said that, we have in the Abravito Doomsday Book of 1241, uh, this African. 1241. 1241. So what does this mean? Now, this is an African image, an image of an African, from an account for Derby. The Abreviato of Doomsday Book was the 13th century version of the original Doomsday Book of 1086, the first survey of the English population. This is one of the only known images of an African in medieval England, but Onyeka feels it's highly significant. But the point is that there was an African that the, or the idea of the African was known in 13th century England. Which is just the right time period. It's just the right period for your African, yeah. yes. People draw pictures of them in image-wise, image yes. And, and therefore, it is highly likely that Africans were part of medieval society. By the 16th century, there are an increasing number of recorded African images in British history, such as that of John Blank, Henry VIII's favourite trumpeteer. But among the 11 million documents at the National Archives is some extraordinary evidence that as the numbers of black people in England increased, attitudes started to change. This document, created between 1595 to 1596, is a record of letters and proclamations created during the reign of Elizabeth I. Okay. Um, this letter is addressed to the Lord Mayors mm -hmm. of the major cities, and it says in the letters, if you look, it is says it, oh, the word... Blackamoors. You notice that word there? It says Blackamoors here and Blackamoors there. So this is another word for African individual, That's a Blackamoor. Right. The word moor by itself means black, and black added on means essentially black. Black, black. black yes. So it's emphasising what these people look like. Right. Um, but the letter reads, an open letter to the Lord Mayors of London and the Alderman, his brethren, and to all other mayors, sheriffs and Her Majesty, understanding that, uh, that there are of late diverse blackamoors brought into this realm, of which kind of persons there are already here too many, uh. considering how God hath blessed this land with great increase of people of our own nation. Onyeka believes that the lack of mentions in records is simply because in medieval times people saw less need to comment on the colour of a person's skin. So far, the team has relied on anthropology and historical research to establish the origins of the Ipswich man. But as they reassemble at the evidence board, it's time to see if these conclusions will be supported by some hard science. Was this man alive during medieval times? And does he definitely come from Africa? OK, today we're going back to Ipswich man. Um, this is the... Sub-Saharan African male, possibly medieval, and that's because there was a belt buckle with one of the individuals from that group that was a medieval belt buckle. Sue has been sent the results of the carbon dating. The material is human bone. Good. And, oh, I like having knowledge that no one else has got. So, well, the date that they have given us, in terms of the range, is going to be... Da-da-da. 1190. AD and 1300 AD. So that's coming in at 805 years, plus or minus 30, before the present date. Wow. <laughs> I'm a white pen, sir. So the date of the Ipswich man is confirmed. And Wolfram also has some exciting results. Um, and, and I have a better chance coming from Mars than this guy having come from, <laughs> from Ipswich. <laughs> because the two, the, the two states are definitely put him in a, in a hot climate, near coastal, near equatorial climate. So that the south, south is most point from a European perspective would be something like Portugal, maybe southern parts of Spain. Okay. Uh, but, and, then, and then we have to move either into the Middle East or basically northern Africa, places like Sierra Leone, Morocco, okay. that sort of thing. The stable isotope testing of the tooth supports Caroline's opinion that the skeleton is North African. But the tests done on the man's leg bone prove he died somewhere like the UK. 
bone oxygen data is consistent with where he was buried. Okay. In the broadest possible sense. We can't um, really say no. it's, it's absolutely pinpoint accuracy, Ipswich, but it's consistent with the UK. And that, that tends to be consistent that says this is at least 10 years in this sort of if not, um, if, if not if, more. If, if not more. It's definitely inconsistent with anything that's arid on warm and near equatorial so or coastal. But he grew up in a, in a yes, warm, there are two dry different place and, he, and, yeah. and the last part of his cold life miserable. he was in a cold, there two, wet There place, are two so. different, and, and, and he must have lived in, in, that, in that cold, that lime for let's say, at least 10 years. Okay. okay. The scientific analysis has provided two vital pieces of information. The team now have proof that the skeleton dates from between 1190 and 1300 AD and is likely to have come from somewhere in northern Africa or possibly southern Europe, but it has not narrowed it down to an exact country. Nevertheless, this information allows Xanthi to focus her historical research. And for Sue, it opens a new line of inquiry. You know, at the outset, we just wondered, what, was there an ethnic issue here? Oh, boy, is there an ethnic issue? There's a real ethnic issue. We have an African gentleman in Ipswich in the 1200s. Now, there is no doubt. So the science that's come together with the history, with the archaeology, this is really interesting. This is really important. What was he doing there? The man's exact country of origin is still unclear, but another scientist hopes that further analysis will reveal this information. Ian Barnes from the Royal Holloway University of London has come to Dundee to take a sample of bone for DNA analysis. He hopes to find a DNA sequence that could identify the exact origins of the Ipswich man. He wears protective clothing to avoid contaminating the sample with his own DNA. One of the concerns is that DNA from other individuals may actually get into the sample. So in order to avoid having our real DNA from, from the skeleton getting swamped out, we try and work as carefully and as cleanly as possible, and then hopefully we'll be able to get a real sequence out of it that comes from that skeleton, not from outside. Xanthi is back on the historical trail. Why did the man come here? What brought an African from a life on the Mediterranean to a burial next to an English friary? The friary where the skeleton was discovered was built by Franciscan Grey Friars, who originally came over to England from Italy in 1224. The Grey Friars were great travelers, spreading their word and converting people across Europe to their cause. Is this how the Ipswich man came to England? Did he come here as a friar? Xanthi has come to meet Brother Philippe, a modern-day Grey Friar, to hopefully learn more about who our man was. The friary in Ipswich was founded in the first years of the reign of Edward I, so it was certainly founded before 1298, because it was founded by a fellow called Sir Robert Tiptot and mm -hmm. his wife Una. And Robert Tiptot died in 1298. So right. we know it was in the reign of Edward I, um, probably the 1270s, but absolutely certainly before the 1290s. If he was found within the friary grounds, who would have been buried there? Well, that's interesting, because in 1250, Pope Innocent IV, in a letter called Cum Tamquam Veri, um, gave to the friars the privilege to be able to bury the friars and those of the family, so those, those people who serve the friars. Oh, I see. So the fact that he was in a <coughs> friary, a burial ground associated with a friary, is indicative he was either a friar or he worked with the friars in support of them? Probably. It, it, would be, it would be certainly possible that he could be a friar, I think. On the other hand, he could have been a, um, a, a person who was sort of close to the friars, who, who worked with them, who, who did a lot, a lot for them or with them, who was, was buried there. You know, those would be, I say, the two strongest possibilities. One of the individuals within the group had a belt buckle with them, which is medieval. Okay. So obviously that would be a personal possession, wouldn't it? If, he, if this was a group of friars, would one of them have had personal possessions with them like that? Well, the, the friars themselves 
wouldn't have been allowed personal possessions. The, the, friars, the friars would have been buried in, in their habit, mm -hmm. and um, the Franciscans used a, a, a rope to, to bind themselves, and they didn't have belts. So having a belt buckle would indicate that this was somebody who was not a Franciscan friar, um, but, but possibly a, a, a lay helper or, or somebody else who, had been, who would have been buried in the um, graveyard. Yeah. Although the belt buckle may not have belonged to the Ipswich man, its presence in the burial ground challenges the idea that he himself was a friar. But to be buried next to a friary, he would have needed to be a Christian, at a time when most of North Africa was predominantly Muslim, and when Muslims and Christians were at war. The friary was built by a man called Robert Tiptoft in the 13th century. This was when Europe and the Middle East were consumed by the Crusades, a series of ferocious wars fueled by the clashing ideologies of Islam and Christianity. Dr. Adrian Bell from the University of Reading has been hunting for records that could link the Ipswich man with the friary. Could he have come to England as a result of the Crusades? We know that Lord Tiptoth um, actually built the friary, didn't he? So I understand that there may be a link between our individual and Tiptoth. Yes, and he established Friary sometime in the 1270s, and he's actually buried there, and we know that from this... Actually in the Friary grounds itself? Yes, exactly, oh, okay. yeah. And uh, we know this from this uh, book uh, called Weaver's Funerary Monuments, uh, which was, is, is an antiquarian historian in the 1600s who goes around churches writing down what he sees in them. And here he describes the Grey Friary at Ipswich, uh, where he says, the Grey Friars founded by Lord Tiptoft, in which lay buried Sir Robert Tiptoft, knight, uh -huh. and his wife. Uh, the interesting thing is that Robert Tiptoff himself travels to the Holy Land as part of a crusade. Oh, really? Uh, led by the Lord Edward, that's the future Edward I, um, from 1270 to 1271. Uh, and they stop at various places, uh, including Tunis. The Ninth Crusade is commonly seen as the last major mission to the Holy Land. On their way, the Knights of Prince Edward stopped at Tunis with King Louis of France, who was renowned for converting Muslims to Christianity. Accompanying Edward was Robert Tiptoft. We actually have evidence that Tiptoft did go on crusade. Uh, it can be found in the Pipe Roll, uh, which is basically a government document showing expenditure. And it actually shows here that it's paid out to Robert Tiptoft uh, for his service with six knights, that's himself and five others, mm -hmm and they're paid 100 marks each uh, for that service. It's Latin. That's in Latin, yeah. yes. So these are original pipe rolls, a collection uh, uh, showing who was paid, and there's 225 knights in total paid here, 100 marks each. For their crusading activity? For their crusading activity. So yeah. we have evidence here that Tiptoff, who was buried in Ipswich, who actually developed the fire in Ipswich, went on these crusading activities to North Africa. Was there any evidence to show that Africans were actively brought back to England as part of this crusade? Yes, there is, because in the uh, Flores Historiarum, we have an entry for 1272, uh, where it actually says that um, after their voyage from the, the Holy Land, uh, a number of nobles, including Thomas of Clare, or Thomas de Clare, who is also with Robert Tiptoft on crusade, um, brought back four uh, captive Saracens. Uh, and in that sense, Saracen is a word that's used to describe Muslim or someone from North Africa. Okay, so he could have been converted and then brought back during one of the Crusades. Yeah, I mean, that's, that seems a likely story for the, the 1270 Crusade. One of the knights accompanying Tiptoft on the Crusade, Thomas de Clare, is recorded as having brought four Saracens back to London with him. Whether they were prisoners, trophies or free men will remain a mystery. But this makes it plausible that Tiptoft himself also brought back Africans, such as our Ipswich man, from Tunisia to England. Although the evidence is over 700 years old, it has finally provided an explanation for how the Ipswich man travelled from Africa to England. I mean, obviously, we're never going to know exactly why this individual was in Ipswich. But what's interesting is we've actually found a documented case of how people were being moved around the world from North Africa to the UK.
Back in Dundee, Caroline is starting the facial reconstruction. Using a 3D scan of the skull, she begins to layer on the muscles and build up the foundations of our man's face. In theory, you shouldn't need to know the ancestry of an individual to reconstruct their face because the majority of the standards that we use apply to all ancestry groups. And if somebody has a, a narrow nasal aperture, for example, they're always going to have a narrow nose regardless of the ancestry group that they come from. But there are fine details that are reliant on knowing the origins of the individual and they will make small differences to the face. Caroline might have to make a best guess about the man's skin tone and eye colour. Well, those details will be reliant on knowing whereabouts the individual is from, which is obviously a slightly problematic for us. Already, a distinctive face is emerging. I think because it was quite a robust skull with, that was very large, with heavy brow ridges and clearly a very large neck, I had this preconceived idea that he was going to be quite big and butch, which he is, but he's also got a very nice, balanced features that um, mean that he's a lot more attractive than I thought he was going to be. With both the historical and scientific evidence having made good progress, the team reassembles at the evidence board. Historical evidence points to the man possibly coming from Tunis in North Africa. But will Ian Barnes be able to confirm this with the DNA testing? Hi, Ian. Hi. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right, yeah. How Good. Are you? Um, we're surviving. It's a sunny and very warm day in Dundee, which doesn't happen very often. No. <laughs> Should you be outside? Probably, in, in bikinis, but it would, it would scare oh, the yeah. horses, so we won't do that. Um, <laughs> what have you got for us? Right, so uh, we've got some DNA out the sample there, anyway. Basically, we find it today uh, on both on the north and south shores of the Mediterranean, yeah, so all the way from Spain uh, going east uh, through Italy, Greece, and then on the southern shore we find it in Morocco and in Egypt, um, and then we find it in Turkey. That ties up with what my conclusions were on the, on, the, on the geographic origin from what I got from the teeth. So what you are saying from the DNA seems to fit very nicely with the stabiliser tool. Thanks very right. much Thanks indeed, Ian. Thanks, Thanks Ian. Ian. Okay. Cheers, right. Bye. 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 Although the DNA analysis agrees with Wolfram's stable tape results, it's not narrowed down the skeleton's origin to a specific country. But Sue wants to bring all the data together. The anthropological study of his bones, the stable isotope tests, and now the DNA results. Can all three disciplines work together? So we're still happy about, mm -hmm. about the African ancestry yeah. in yeah. some regards. What we're less happy about is sub-Saharan sub yeah. label that was given at the outset. Yeah. Mm. And there are areas that Ian has suggested and that your isotopes have also suggested yeah. that it could be that we're less happy with because it doesn't fit with the anthro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the area where the anthro, the isotopes and the DNA all come together that they're happy as along the north coast of Africa. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. The conclusions are compelling. Ipswich Man is likely to be of North African origin. This supports the idea that he started his life in Tunisia before being brought back to the UK during the Ninth Crusade. To have those three areas all pinpointing you down to the same part of the world in scientific terms is huge. It's big, it's amazing. It's just, you know, it's what gets scientists excited. We know what he's gonna look like. We know where he's come from. But what we don't know is why he's there and ultimately what it was that killed him. We don't know that either. So he's a little bit out of focus still. <laughs> Sue wants to know how he died. She decides to take another look at the skeleton. Do the bones have anything left to reveal about the end of this man's life? There's a general principle in policing which says once you get to the point of a cold case, where a case goes as far as it can and it doesn't come to a conclusion, the best thing you can do in terms of policy is go back to the beginning and start again. Look at it again in a slightly different light, maybe with other questions 
foremost in your mind. It's a good, it's a good principle, good forensic principle. Even the smallest detail could transform the investigation. As she looks at the spinal column, something grabs her attention. I think I may just have found a cause of death. It's a thrilling discovery. What is interesting, which was missed the last time, is the fact that it looks like he's got a spinal abscess. So that perfectly round hole is pus formation, so that we've got an infection that's going into the spinal canal. What that will do is that will compress the spinal cord. This is at the level of the, the ninth thoracic vertebrae, so that's going to be affecting lower limb mobility. So that's going to knock out um, a significant number, probably of the sensory and the motor fibres to the lower limb. That there's a lot of pain in that, tremendous amount of pain, and a level of pain that you'd probably want to find some assistance to overcome. I mean, you know, the, the question is, could that kill him? Well, the bottom line is any form of an infection at any time pre-penicillin can kill you. It may be something as simple as a, as a skin scratch or an abscess on a tooth, but an abscess into the spinal cord, then we're going to be talking about a serious amount of infection, an infectious level, so that, yes, that could well have contributed to his death. That's a large sack of pus-filled abscess. If it's at that level there, then the chances are it's spread throughout the rest of his body. You don't have penicillin, you don't have a means to combat those bacteria. The body system just shuts down. In what could turn into an extraordinary twist in this tale, it appears the Ipswich man was disabled and infirm in the last months or years of his life. It also gives the team a probable cause of death, the holy grail of any forensic investigation. So, the team has a profile of where the Ipswich man came from, they know why he might have come to Ipswich, and even how he might have died. But what they still don't know is why he was buried by a friary. What was he doing there? He was discovered with 150 other skeletons. Xanthi is keen to see if any of the other bodies can shed further light on the events surrounding his death. Who were they, and why were they all buried together? Sue Anderson carried out the original bone study of the skeleton. At the St Nicholas Centre, next to the site of the medieval burial ground, 12 of the skeletons found near the Ipswich man have been laid out. So this is our burial population from the grave site just up the road, isn't it? So what are we looking at here? We've got 12, 12 individuals laid out. Yeah. What's unusual about this population then? It's, it's got a, quite a high proportion of um, pathological specimens and um, okay. also quite a high proportion of men and older individuals. It quickly becomes apparent that this is no ordinary group of skeletons. This is probably something called diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've got some pathology here. Obviously. He's got areas of uh, infection and inflammation on his legs. He had quite an enlarged... Um, frontal bone. So, it's... Oh, so he would have looked unusual as well? Yeah. This would be a result of a number of disease processes, wouldn't it? There's basically no cavity there, is there, for the white blood cells at all? That's weird. And bone should not look like that, should it? You've got three vertebrae completely fused here. Another pretty unhealthy individual. He's got uh, a disease called Paget's disease. Yeah. Um, Almost all the bodies exhibit signs of debilitating disease or injury. Yes, finer. It's got a very large abscess formed here. So she's got a spinal abscess. Now that's yeah. interesting because the individual that we're looking at had a spinal abscess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And certainly that one isn't healed. No, no, no. So this would still have been active at the time of death. Yeah. So none of these people are healthy, are yep. they? <laughs> There's nobody here that just, I don't know fell over and hit the head and died. These are all people who have had some long-term long -term pathology yeah. disease that's showing that they've had long enough that it's showing in their skeleton. Exactly, yeah. So it's not something that's killed them quickly? Nope. They're an interesting population, aren't they? <laughs> yes. I 
I'm not an archaeologist by training. I don't go out every day looking at archaeological populations and burial sites, but to me this seems a very unusual population. My first impression of this group is that we're looking at a group that have been buried together for a reason. This is not a, a natural kind of demographic of a burial site that I would expect to see. So my response when I see all of this together evidentially is that we're probably looking at an infirmary population, people who are being cared for and were buried there as a result of their disease or other pathology processes. This site was a final resting place for the profoundly sick. But why? How would a friary have ended up associated with a graveyard full of the diseased and infirm? Was this in fact a medieval hospital? Angela Montfort has written a book that explores the link between friars and medicine in the medieval period. Xanthi has asked her to come to Dundee to see the Ipswich skeleton. The Franciscans in particular were known as apothecaries. Oh, really? They would grow, the, grow herbs for medicine in the infirmary, the friary infirmary garden. And we know that uh, the friars used to um, give medicine charitably to people. Is it likely the friars would actually have been taking care of these individuals on site? There are quite close links between the friars and medicine. When St Francis first told his friars uh, to serve the poor, he was expecting them to visit the sick. The, the whole view of medicine and life generally was that it was all um, one integral part and that the medicine of the soul was also important as the medicine of the body. And so a medical friar could treat both of them. And in fact, some friars were called the physicians of the soul. At a time when religion and medicine went hand in hand, the friars were helping to treat the sick not just with prayers, but also with what was then state-of-the-art medicinal knowledge. Would their treatments have been used to help treat the Ipswich man as he succumbed to the pain and disability of his spinal abscess? Dr. Tig Lang is a herbalist who has studied the use of herbs in medieval medicine. What are we going to be making today? Well, we're going to be making an ointment that would have been used for paralysis. It's mentioned in a herbal called Of the Virtues of Herbs, or Macca Floridus on the Virtues of Herbs. And this herbal was around in the period that we're talking about with, with your skeleton. And the recipe itself reads, this ointment will wonderfully help to the palsy. That, that means it will wonderfully help to heal paralysis. What it actually is isn't an ointment, it's a rubbing oil. And what they're basically intending to do is massage. They say here, if the patient is often with this ointment rubbed with, I love this bit in the English, with hundes, some del harder, which means with, with somewhat hard hands. So they're obviously dealing with somebody who's massaging quite firmly. And this ointment will make all his body supple and easy. Oh, OK. So what we have here is dried pelletry. OK. And Dr. Lang is demonstrating how the herb pelletry could have been used by the friars. Some oil. We've got some oil, which is olive oil. So literally, it's just you just put a few handfuls in, and we'll see what happens when we stir this on the gas. Often, in later recipes, certainly you, you find the instruction to boil it for as long as it takes you to say the paternoster, which is a lovely way of timing if yeah, you think absolutely. if you haven't got yeah. a clock. That's boiling in the oil now. That's boiled long enough, I think, to, to bring the virtues of the herb into okay. the oil. Yes. I couldn't really smell the herbs, but that smells fantastic. It's, it's, it's gone beautifully green. That's quite nice. I quite like yeah. this. And pelletry does have a warming effect. Oh, does it? So, so that it would make the skin For warm massage, up. That so would it's be medieval ralgex. Some kind of therapeutic. We're all acting as if it's hand cream. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. But well, it's quite nice, isn't it's probably it? Probably to get hot hands. <laughs> Obviously, this is not going to help somebody with paralysis, but you know, it may have brought some level of comfort at least. Yes, I think given that his paralysis is leading from a spinal abscess, no yes. amount of what they do to his limbs is going to do no. him any good at all. No. But it's, we can't say they did use this ointment on him, but it's an ointment which was available at the time, which they may have used in an attempt to bring comfort to the patient, uh, or even in their way of an attempt to bring cure to the disease, mm. because they wouldn't have known about the abscess. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think what's nice now is we know that this individual had quite a serious spinal abscess. And I also now know that they, they grew herbs and, and they produced some sort of medicinal herbs for treatment of paralysis. So it's nice to know that even though they couldn't have done anything to assist with the abscess specifically, he may have been getting some sort of palliative care that may have at least eased his discomfort because this would have been a really uncomfortable, painful condition. The picture emerging is of a middle-aged African man living out his final years in England, receiving care from a friary. He lived in the UK in the mid-13th century, and analysis of his bones has proved that he was here for at least 10 years before he died. He could have enjoyed years of good health before ending up in the infirmary. Did he settle here, set up a home, have a family? We can never know. But Xanthi has heard of an exciting new study that suggests our shared ethnic history goes back further than we think. And it's written in our DNA. St Pancras International Railway Station, a modern-day symbol of the global travel that has helped create our ethnically diverse nation. She's here to meet Dr. Mark Jobling, a geneticist from Leicester University. His studies on the male Y chromosome could help support the idea of an early African presence in the UK. What would you say the, the normal view of ancestry in England and the UK is? Well, I think the history books are dominated by the stories we all know about Anglo-Saxons and Vikings and Romans before them and then maybe Celts and Picts and so on. So there isn't much of a place for Africans in that story. So what is the actual ancestry? This pale skin, is it kind of hiding a, a more complex ancestral past? Well, it's certainly, in our study, uh, we find that, that it does hide a bit of a more complex past, yes. So what we were interested in doing was studying a piece of DNA that's passed down from father to son, the Y chromosome. And the nice thing about that is it associates with surnames. And we found that we can look at some surnames and find in them a signature of an African lineage. Could you see this as a visual, or was it just hiding in the genes? Absolutely not. So the man who carried this lived close to our lab, and so we brought him in and talked to him about it. And he's a white, ordinary British guy with no um, history in his family of any contact with Africa. So he was completely surprised about it. So he's a Yorkshire, UK resident, uh, pale skin, typically British looking, but he's got an African heritage? He has, yes. Specifically, he has an African Y chromosome. So this is the piece of DNA that passes down from father to son. So it means back in the past, at some point, he has a paternal ancestor who was an African who came probably from northwestern Africa. What this could mean is that the British population has been multi-ethnic for far longer than we might think. Could our Ipswich man even have contributed himself to this African ancestral signature seen in our DNA today? So the individual that we've been investigating is of African origin, we know that, and he's buried in Ipswich. Is there anything that you know of that could suggest any information that he could have been mixing with the population as far back as the medieval period? Well, there could have been. From our evidence at the moment, we can't say that, but we could imagine finding other surnames where we can trace the history back into the medieval period. And I think if we had large enough sample sizes, we could probably do that. I think what we've found by finding this, this African individual in Ipswich is that possibly the multiracial society that we think of as a very modern construct. We think of Britain as very ethnically diverse now, but only recently. Whereas it seems that this, this African individual in Ipswich may represent a much longer history of multiracial Britain that nobody really knew about. This extraordinary case is reaching a conclusion. Using the modern arsenal of forensic science and historical detective work, the Cold Case team has painstakingly reconstructed a story that could have stayed buried forever. Possibly born a Muslim in 13th century Tunisia, our man could have come to England during the Ninth Crusade, converting to Christianity before living here for some time. As he succumbed to the pain of a spinal abscess in later life, he was very possibly nursed to his death by Franciscan friars, leaving behind irrefutable proof of an African presence in medieval England.
Sue brings the team together at the evidence board for the final time to confirm the cause of death. So we actually missed a spinal abscess. So given where this is occurring, which is at mid to lower thoracic level, we have somebody who is really disabled in their ability to, to move around and to be able to look after themselves. And it's time for the final piece of the jigsaw to fall into place. Caroline is ready to reveal the face of the skeleton for the first time in 800 years. I Let's have a look at him then. maybe my favorite. Okay. Switch man, here we go. Oh. There we go. He's a bit of a bruiser, isn't he? he is. Yeah, it's good. Well, yeah, he's definitely got this big, strong, robust Blinky head and neck. <laughs> um, hair, oh, obviously. Lips, I, mean, I like the lips, actually. Yeah. yeah. His ears are fantastic. Mm. Hair, we don't know. He no, could have had. Quite delicate he could have had a. To the rest. He could have had a full beard. He could have had yeah. lots of hair. He could have gone bald. We have yeah. no idea. Yeah, so, which is why we haven't yeah. given him any of that. Yeah. And we've also got this quite massive neck massive as well. Yeah, but see why you like very, him. He he's was very great. well. He was I very think well he's muscled. quite beautiful, actually. He he's got a great face. Yeah. What is interesting is that the, the historians are saying there, there is evidence that, that we have African individuals in the UK and in England, in specifically, from you know, Roman times. We've certainly got them in the medieval times. We've even got a situation in history where in Tudor times, Elizabeth I is saying, you know, actually we've got too many, we, we need to stop this, we need, we need to send them back. And, and how do you go from a small number of individuals to a community to such a point that you've got the monarchy saying this is too much, we have to be able, you know, we have, we have to stop this happening. Mm. And I think that's interesting. And, and there's no doubt that the historians are saying this hasn't been researched. And I think it should. And if nothing oh, else, yes. what we've done is said, here's one. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yep. here's one. You know, we found it. Excuse me. Um, all the rest, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. This one is. Mm. Start with this one. A man discovered in an unmarked medieval grave could now change the view of our ethnic history. The first impressions, I think, of this case were not very exciting, is the honest truth. And we should learn from that. We really should learn from that, that it's always the case that the ones that look as if they are the most boring often end out to surprise the heck out of us and become really some of the most interesting stories. We have scientifically identified beyond all reasonable doubt, which is all any court in the land will ask of us, is that this individual is of African ancestry. We're happy with the age, we're happy with the sex, we're happy with the stature, and we're absolutely confident on the ethnic or geographical origin of this individual. That's rare, that's very, very rare to get to that point of certainty on ethnicity. And in terms of human history, migration patterns, this is terribly, terribly important.